have you here. Um, yeah, so I am uh, one of the founders of the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network and have been co-coordinator co for since the beginning. And then Marcus came on as co-coordinator a few years ago. And now I'm stepping away from co-coordinator position and Yvonne um, Yen Lois has stepped into that position. So I'm really, really thrilled about that um, transition. I think it'll be just fantastic. Um, let's see, and Marcus, you introduced yourself and Yvonne, I was wondering if you would just do a really quick introduction can you just say a few words? Sure. Um, so um, my name is Yvonne. I'm based in Los Angeles. I'm um, also with the Solidarity Research Center. Um, and yeah, I know I'm really excited to, to be on this, uh, to, to be serving with the Solidarity Economy Network. Um, Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to let folks know, this is the first uh, webinar of a two-part series. Um, so the theme is solidarity economy and resist and build as two sides of the same um, interlinked coin. Um, and so the first webinar is, is going to be with Kali Akuno, and we're super honored to have him join us. He'll be talking more about um, what resist and build uh, solidarity economy looks like on a local level. Um, looking at Cooperation Jackson and the Jackson Cush plan. And then the next webinar will be take looking at, at the issue from a, a national level. So we'll have some folks from Movement for Black Lives. Um, and we haven't set that date yet, so stay tuned for those details. Yeah, um, yeah so um, I want to say a little tiny bit about Solidarity Economy Network. Um, so we formed in 2007 at the US Social Forum. We um, organized a, 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 a track of workshops and a series of meetings. And it was decided there in 2007 to form this network. So we're a national network uh, working to build a solidarity economy in the United States, as well as to connect it to the international global movement to build a solidarity economy. So we represent the United States as a, ne as a national network to repess. Uh, so repess is the, it makes sense in Spanish and French, uh, but it's basically the international solidarity economy uh, network. Um, so we're all about building solidarity economy nationally as well as internationally. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, before we actually get started with our conversation with Kali, I wanted to um, just make sure that we're all on the same page um, as to what is a solidarity economy. So I'm going to give a, a quick thumbnail sketch. Um, so one, it is, as I mentioned, it's a global movement to build another world, to build uh, a post-capitalist um, system, a post-capitalist economy and society um, that really works for people and planet, put, puts that at the front and center of our work, um, as opposed to blind growth and uh, profit maximization. Um, so solidarity economy is not a blueprint. It's not a line organization. It's grounded in values. The values that we articulate in the US Solidarity Economy Network are five. Um, so we talk about solidarity, cooperation, mutualism, et cetera. Uh, we talk about um, uh, participatory democracy, so not just uh, voting in elections every few years, but bringing democracy into the workplace, into our communities, into our daily lives. Uh, we talk about equity, equity in all dimensions, so across the board, right? Anti-oppression, um, equity in terms of race, class, gender, etc. cetera. Uh, we talk about sustainability, um, and the last one is pluralism. And pluralism means that it's not a one size fits all model. We believe that different things will work in different places, different times, different cultures, different contexts. Um, and so it's a, it's a humble framework um, where you know, we believe that we have to experiment as well, but things need to align with the principles, with the values. Um, so yeah, it's a global movement grounded in values um, drawing on existing practices, looking out and seeing what practices exist in the world um, that align with these principles and values. And so 
solidarity economy, in addition to being a movement to build solidarity economy, is also a set of practices and relationships um, that align with the values. Uh, so there's a huge foundation upon which to build that exists in every sector of, uh, of, of the economy. Um, for example, um, well, actually, let me also say that some of these are old practices, some of these are new, some of these are mainstream, some of them are, are alternative. Um, just some examples to throw out, give you an example, um, cooperatives, worker cooperatives, housing cooperatives, food co-ops, um, producer cooperatives, um, as well as things like uh, community land trusts, uh, part, uh, participatory budgeting, public banks, social currency, time, time banks, community supported agriculture, commons, mutual aid networks, and then things that are not monetized like skill shares, um, do it yourself um, uh, work or producing for yourself, community gardens, gift exchange. Um, so I could go on. Oh, actually an important one I just want to mention is care work. So non-monetized care work. So this is a way in which all of us have either benefited from or are participating in solidarity economy insofar as we're doing really, really a substantial valuable economic labor in terms of um, being raised by our by caregivers, our parents, or what, or whoever brought us up, um, or we're we're being caregivers um, to our children, to our elders, to our community. Uh, so that's an important point that it's both monetized as well as non-monetized activity. Um, so solidarity economy is a framework that pulls all these pieces, these practices together, and tries to articulate um, a system. Right, an economic system, a social system that really transforms our, our, not only our economy, but our economy is really broadly defined. So both po political and social systems. So that we're, it's, it's a really different way of living, working, um, creating livelihoods and relating to each other. Um, so right now, a lot of those um, examples that I mentioned are kind of invisible, except for the, the ones that are very mainstream, like a lot of public sector um, uh, institutions, like public schools, public libraries, public uh, parks. We would embrace these as part of the solidarity economy. Those are visible, but a lot of the other things are invisible and they're sundered, right? They're in silos. So solidarity is trying to knit that together, um, really to push this systemic post-capitalist um, framework and vision. So I'm going to end with that um, kind of uh, broad uh, definition and turn to Kali and, um, and welcome. Kali, can we get you on video? Can we get, um, do you have a camera? Can you activate no, it? No, there's no camera. Where Bummer. I'm oh, it's so it's so nice, how so how nice how to I, see you. Hold on. I, I was just corrected by. Um, we might get video. Um, so yeah, we are so thrilled to have Kali and maybe here we'll be able to see him in a moment. Um, here, I mean, Kali is always like amazing to talk to and listen to profound, deep, um, just amazing experience and wealth of knowledge. Um, just, uh, always thoughtful and, um, and in addition, and I think in solidarity economy, this is also this is also an important important point. Um, Kali is also a really really nice guy, a really good human being. Um, so it's not only you know people's minds and their activism that we we value, but it's also being a good human being. And Kali is certainly that. So um, yeah, I want to welcome you, Kali, to this space. We still have you, yeah? No, I'm still here. Really. Okay, Bye. I can't even. I can't even see a new video and it just Present. didn't work. I'm having a, <laughs> okay. Oh, that's too bad. Um, gremlins are messing with me and the technology. Right. Uh, I know I know those gremlins. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's let's um, start in on this um, conversation. Oh, we do see something, but it's a static picture of Cooperation Jackson. I think anyway, let's get into this this chat. Um, so I wanted to start by by um, 
talking about the theme uh, of this webinar, which is resist and build. And, um, you know, solidarity economy is kind of the build, right? Going ahead and building our economy, um, our new world. Um, but we, we've always said that it's important to marry this with the resist end of things, right? Uh, because there's so much, um, there's so much inequality, there's so much injustice, there's so much oppression that really needs to be um, resisted and, and then and married to the build work. So I wanted to ask you um, how this, how, what your take is on this, as well as what does this look like in Jackson? Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, um, thanks you know, for hosting me, including me uh, in, and thank you all for putting this series uh, together. We need more of these on a consistent basis. Uh, I think to increase the level of dialogue, discussion, strategizing, uh, and debate that we need within the movement. Um, but to dump into your, your question, um, the entire framework, the entire notion of the Jackson Cush plan is really built on this resistant build uh, um, dynamic as we understood it. Um, you know, the, the quintessential things that we uh, are resisting uh, in our context uh, are definitely settler colonialism, uh, white supremacy, uh, capitalism, um, it, it's kind of the, the bedrocks of uh, the movement uh, in Mississippi for Black liberation and, and the emancipation of, of all the different peoples who live in uh, Mississippi, indigenous people, uh, white working class people, uh, et cetera. Uh, but focusing in on, you know, the Black experience in particular, uh, the resist was, you know, not only pushing back on that, overcoming that, but really trying to lay out a strategic framework and a working plan on how to build power, first and foremost, within Black working class communities uh, to utilize our numbers in Jackson uh, and in the Cush District, which is uh, better known as the, the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and these are areas where there are, are overwhelming in most parts of the Jackson Cush area, overwhelming Black majorities. And so the struggle has been how to take you know, that numeric uh, uh, demographic presence, that base, and transform it not just into political power, you know, through the ballot box, which is one, one way of kind of exercising a type of power, but ultimately to use, utilize that in a transformative way uh, to transform the economy, uh, to then be able to create new social relationships and the society that we envision. And so the, the, the fight part, the resist part, uh, is beating back the various institutions and social forces that, that uh, are committed to maintaining domination, hierarchy, and oppression, uh, but also in the process transforming them, but also transforming ourselves to, to create a social order that's not based upon competition, that's not based upon profit, but is based upon solidarity, is based upon eliminating various forms of hierarchy and oppression, and is, I think, also quintessentially about restoring an ecological balance, uh, you know, uh, between society, human society, and nature, which we think in the long term is, is a critical piece that we have to overcome in order to you know, stave off uh, the what potentially could be the genocidal uh, uh, impact of climate change, not only upon the human species, but upon complex life in, in general. So that's the general like framework of the resist side. Now the build side, you know, you in our context, the, the resist piece is also about eliminating the constraints legally and financially I can't stress that enough, that uh, are imposed upon Black people exercising self-determination and organizing their lives. So changing land ownership is a major component 
of, uh, of our struggle, uh, changing who and how uh, different projects get financed, uh, cooperatives in Mississippi and most black businesses in general, minority businesses in general, uh, uh, are capital starved in Mississippi. And this is a political instrument uh, that is used to keep particularly working class communities, which the black community overwhelmingly is, uh, in a very static and exploitable state. Uh, and in Mississippi, um, you know, some of the lowest wages in the country exist in Mississippi uh, that are imposed by really maintaining the, in essence, the plantation relationships that got constructed in, in the 18th century in the state with some changes granted, but, but some things fundamentally structurally have remained in place, particularly within the Delta. So the, the fight in the bill piece in our, in our case, in, in the resist piece, they go hand in hand because there's some structures that we have to just get out of the way in order to enable democratic expression and collaborative expression and solidarity to actually take hold and manifest in a way that we can build co-ops, uh, land trusts, uh, et cetera. So uh, one particular route that, that we have gone, uh, which is you know probably what Jackson in the last couple of years is most noted for, uh, is uh, exercising a certain degree of political power through the electoral arena. And in our case, capturing the mayor's office, you know, uh, now two of the last uh, uh, three election cycles in, in, uh, in Jackson. And then there's also uh, this instrument, which I think is the most fundamental piece that we've been trying to construct uh, within the overall framework of the Jackson Cush plan, which is the People's Assembly, uh, to be very explicitly an instrument of dual power. And that dual power for us is challenging, checking and holding uh, the state, the government, accountable, uh, but then also self-directing and self-organizing the community to build alternative sets of relationships and build a new economy. So Cooperation Jackson is born, uh, was born very explicitly to work on and develop the solidarity economy portion of this strategy coming out of some directors from the People's Assembly many years ago. Um, and so what this looks like right now on a practical level in, uh, in Jackson, you know, we, Cooperation Jackson just celebrated its fourth birthday in May this year. So we're still young, uh, still learning, still experimenting, uh, still kind of gaining our sea legs in many respects. But in, in this course of time, uh, we've been able to get a few co-ops up and running uh, off the ground. Uh, and I'll just talk about a few of them, uh, which I think are at the kind of most advanced stages in our uh, uh, case right now. So there's Freedom Farms uh, Co-op, which is an urban farming uh, cooperative. Um, uh, there's La Sol Erotic uh, uh, Catering, uh, caf you know, in, uh, cafe uh, cooperative. And then there's the Green Team, uh, which is a lawn care uh, an emerging compost uh, cooperative. And all of these entities are, I would say realistically about two years old. Uh, and they're all basically at a stage wherein uh, some of the grounding support and the anchoring that Cooperation Jackson as a main body was doing uh, in terms of uh, providing uh, stipends for some of the key organizers, which we call anchors. We're transitioning out of that because they're all beginning to realize enough of a profit that they can just operate totally on their own. So this is a major piece of transition and growth for us. And then the next piece that's uh, coming online, uh, which I'm probably the most ecstatic about is our community production uh, cooperative, um, which most people might know as a fab lab, but it, we intend for it to be much more than that. Uh, and, and we're trying to really expand on this notion of community production, wherein um, utilizing the, the innovations of the third digital you know, revolution, if you like that framework, but these new technologies, utilizing that so that we can begin, uh, first and foremost, by owning our own means of production, but that we can begin to produce 
on demand to meet some of the basic fundamental productive needs of our community. And this to us is a major breakthrough because we think it, it's a way of shifting out of certain uh, parameters of, of uh, capitalist logic. And the, the main one I think for us is if we are able to produce on demand, it eliminates a lot of the excess extraction of materials that the capitalist system currently is embedded in. And then the tremendous amount of waste that the system produced through plan obsolescence and just overproduction. Uh, so that it, it, for us, this technology enables us to, to take some further steps forward uh, towards meeting some of our long-term ecological objectives, but also it allows us to, to dig deeper in the actual practice of democracy by putting the, the production itself to a democratic process of saying, hey, what do we need? What are the, the various costs that are associated in terms of raw material, in terms of labor? And then how do we democratically figure out how to distribute the product that's produced uh, in a way that meets various forms of, of equity? So we think this could be a very uh, revolutionary breakthrough over time. It's not going to happen overnight, but over time. And, and we are opening up uh, our community production center uh, in September. The grand opening will probably be in October. And then we're going to start the first round of, of uh trainings with different folks, particularly folks who are, you know, re-entering the community, uh, which is a particular focus of ours. We're going to start that in January. And we see this piece being a very central piece to adding on to, and then I'll, I'll stop for more questions, adding to another piece that we have, uh, which was in many respects a grounding piece to, to our work. And that was... Uh, we took almost, at the beginning, the first two years in particular, we took ev almost every penny that we had in terms of a resource, and we invested in the construction of a community land trust. And we bought a fair number of, of vacant parcels, uh, uh, dilapidated homes, and several structures, including our, our main center, which is now called the Balagoon uh, Center after Kwasi Balagoon. Um, and, and, and soon to be our community production uh, center. Um, so we did that as a major component of a build, like building our actual physical capacity, building our ability uh, to have uh, uh, enough space, enough acreage to actually do a, a heavy degree or large degree of productive farming capacity. Uh, but there's another piece which is very much anchored in the resist in us choosing to do the land trust, and that is fighting gentrification uh, as a political instrument to undermine the overall political project and the social transformation project that we know capital has very much uh, its eye on from very open plans that exist. One of the key expressions if someone wants to look it up, uh, there's a plan which is somewhat obsolete, but it was called Plan 2022 for Jackson, Mississippi, right? So our Jackson plan and this plan 2022, really, if you want to look at it, were kind of mirrors uh, uh, of opposition uh, to each other. And uh, luckily, I think for, for us and for, I think, the broader social movement, we've been able to win out, at least on the political side, to create enough leverage for the, the development of cooperation Jackson uh, and other projects like ours in the city to kind of exist, thrive, struggle, you know, learn some new lessons and grow. So, you know, for us, the, the resist side is very much built into the actual component of the build side for us. If you look at that last piece in particular around the community land trust and what the long-term strategic aim that we have and not only uh, preserving the, the kind of present demographic con uh, con uh, composition of the community, uh, but transforming in the long term overall land relationships so we decommodify land and then we can democratize how it is used on a much deeper uh, level around food production and ultimately one of the things we want to get into is the construction of, of eco uh, villages you know to scale where we are able to to a certain degree uh, take most of the housing off completely off the grid and have them be self-sustainable uh, as a long-term project in the process of what we're, what we're aiming to go. Well, that is brilliant. What a brilliant rundown. Um, just really quickly, could you just, in case 
somebody doesn't know what a community land trust is, could you just mm -hmm. briefly say what that is? Yeah, community land trust. Um, it's fundamentally uh, an organization or a community acquiring land and then holding that land in common, uh, usually for an extended period of time, wherein uh, this, this community organization is a steward of this land uh, and holds it for um, affordable development over a course of time by managing uh, the equity uh, of the land itself and the property that is built upon it so that that equity stays at a, at a base level within the project to keep sustaining it, right? But the key component I would stress uh, uh, within the community land trust is holding land in common in a democratic structure, be it on a broad community level or be it within a nonprofit institution, uh, which you know is operating along broad democratic principles and is accountable uh, to the community. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect, so you did a, such a beautiful job of, of laying out the relationship between um, the, the strategy to achieve political power and, and through electoral work um, with the grassroots organizing and the, the people's assembly and then the build part and how they all fit and in, there's all this interplay. Um, in my in my experience, there's a lot. Of, there are a lot of um, radical, uh, progressive organization movement organizations that are um, either doing uh, the resist work and not engaging in the build. And then there's a there's a fair amount of the uh, the build work that isn't really connected up with the with the social movements and the resist. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on what you think are some of the dangers of of that disconnect? Oh that's a that's a we need volumes and volumes <laughs> <laughs> uh, to speak on that. Um, but I think in, in short, you know, uh, I think we are in a and have been here for a while, but I think all of us uh, grappling with, we know the system needs to change. I think on a very deep level, uh, I would wager all of us know that we know this system is not sustainable, but we're not clear on, on what it is we, what we want. We know we want certain things to stop, but you know, what is it that we are for and where are we, where are we headed? And, and there's an absence I think that we have, uh, right now in terms of really articulating that strongly. And I don't think that there's necessarily, uh, that's per se a total weakness. I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a place where we have to have a broad, uh, open-ended discussion, democratic discussion, but we have to start the discussion. And I think the, the disconnect between the folks who are doing the build side of the work, you know, building co-ops, building community land trusts, uh, uh, trying to re, re, you know, store what many people call the commons, is that the, the, there are several different dangers that the folks who are building in the abstract of, of the folks who are doing the fighting against, you know, uh, uh, against, you know, sexism, against racism, you know, against economic inequality. I'm going to start with, I think, some of the main dangers are on the build side, is that Folks have a lot of great ideas, a lot of great energy, which is not often deeply tied to communities and what their needs are. And some of the inherent logic, particularly what we've seen in some of the, the co-op spaces in particular, is that you wind up creating, uh, say, high-end uh, product value cooperatives in the form of you know, what most people rally against the most is, is like uh, um, all natural food co-ops. And, you know, and, and these are good place in, in the Latino community or in the black community, um, primarily because the rents may be cheaper there or the property's value may be cheaper there. So it's a place where 
the folks who are designing this co-op say, hey, this would this is what makes it market affordable. But then you you put a product uh, in that folks in those community don't necessarily use, don't necessarily uh, want, and then can't afford the high end products. And so, but it becomes a window towards an opening for another demographic, another set of communities, uh, which reinforces patterns of gentrification and just continue and perpetuate all of the deep inequalities that exist in our society. So it starts with the good aim of trying to meet a particular need around, you know, broad say ecological questions or health questions. But if it's disconnected from the political struggles and the reality of the folks in, in, in our communities, then it actually becomes a force being used against us and counter to the aims of social justice than reinforcing it. And I'm trying to just ground it in an example wherein if we're not in some real dialogue, then even a lot of the good things that could be done in terms of creating a lot of alternative spaces, alternative uh, uh, social relationships, they become limited because they do not include and are not intended to include, not often, sometimes by on purpose, but oftentimes, you know, not, that you wind up excluding certain communities and certain forces and then reinforcing dynamics. So the two, in our view, have to constantly go together so that the, the build part is actually in the service of ending inequality, ending inequity in our society, and is, do, is, is doing that very intentionally, consciously, and deliberately. Beautiful, thank you, perfect. Um, yeah, uh, so just pulling back to solidarity economy, I think always like lifting up that, um, that equity piece, right, social justice, um, racial equity and really making sure that that's present and front and center is so important. And so I, I, I just think it's something that the solidarity economy framework um, tries to really center and that we should always be talking to each other about centering that. And that's partly about being connected to social movements, but also just where, just, uh, just having that really centered in the way that we think about solidarity economy. Um, certainly so in my neck of the woods in Western Mass, there's a lot, a lot of, for example, co-ops. Most of them tend to be in the up, upper valley, which is relatively, relatively homogeneous and affluent and white, well-educated, and then nothing in the lower valley. So um, where the urban centers are. So mm. it's really a matter of very deliberately saying, well, if we really want to build a solidarity economy, it has to work in all kinds of communities, not only right. the affluent um, communities. And yeah, I think your point about some um, solidarity economy practices can be like the thin wedge of gentrification. And that's a really important point um, to keep in mind. Um, and other times, right, there are, are sometimes um, the, the goods and services that, that get produced in solidarity economy also need to be affordable, right? right? And some right. of them are very high end. That's right. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, yeah, so I was also wondering uh, what, what you think about um, the movement in general, where are we at? What feels like um, what really is in need of further development um, and strengthening in terms of the movement. And so this is both the resist and the, the build, really the, the movement to build a, a, a post-capitalist, another world, right? Right. Big question. Whew, where do we begin? <laughs> um, I mean, for sure, um, more work has to be done uh, building bridges and then building bridges between um, the movements for racial justice in the, in the United States, you know, which have been uh, reemerging and strengthening, I think, over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, the, um, it's been a strong indigenous movement you know, uh, I think the last decade, from I don't know more, uh, on through to um, uh, the movement against uh, um, uh, in the Standing Rock. Um, 
and other aspects of the climate justice movement um, where indigenous uh, folks have been giving, I think, a, a core anchor to the leadership of those movements. Um, and of course, there's the movement for black lives, um, uh, but there's also, it doesn't have a name, but there's also been, I would argue, corresponding movements within uh, various Latino communities, you know, uh, in, in the Southwest uh, and in the immigrant rights community. Um, more work really needs it to be done to, to uh, put the tools of the solidarity economy at uh, the benefit of these movements and the communities in which they represent uh, to really change a lot of the power dynamics that exist. And so there's a scaling up that needs to happen, you know, uh, there both within existing work uh, like ours, I would say that, you know, um, there's a number of different ways in which we're trying to scale up the resources to do so, but also some capacity raising to do so. Uh, that's Can you one. Say a little bit more specifically about what kind of tools would be useful. What, what would that look like? In our case, or just in general? Mm, maybe both. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think in 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 uh, in the general sense, um, definitely just a. Uh, uh, there are some tools that, that I hope one day I could steal away some time to do to do what I'm thinking about, for instance. I'll, I'll start with that, which is, uh, I think, Jessica Gordon Emhar's book, for all those who, of you who haven't uh, on the call who haven't read it or seen it, called Collective Courage. I think there are some basic um, uh, curricular modules that need to be built that both break down the history, but then are also one on cooperative kind of one-on-ones that are very much in tune with how has this manifested, how might it help within the cultural framework and dynamics of black communities, Latino communities that are, that are very tailored and specific to address some of those needs and then put it in a framework of, you know, this is how building a community land trust you know, would relate to a fight against gentrification, but how to, to also then raise it in, well, what would the land trust actually do? Do you want it to just hold property? Typically, no. You know, what could what could then generate, uh, uh, say, income for your community in a way which is non-extractive, non-exploited? And then what are ways in which you can distribute social goods and services, you know, in a non-exploitative way? I think we need some basic, one on one, one on two, you know, one, one on one courses that we distribute throughout these movements in a very broad level that that we're we're starting to do, but I think it's still not sufficient enough that we can scale up, make it simpler, and then do some things, you know, just just have some folks do like little five minute, you know, clips that we can put on Twitter, YouTube, with all these other social media things that just give a breakdown for those types of audiences and you know, Spanish and English and, you know, French for Haitian and other, you know, communities that speak French, you know, uh, here that touch on how all these different things relate to first just stimulate the imagination that, that something like this is possible. And then I think we need to, to, to the, figure out a way to meet the, the, the question that always comes up, like, well, these are great ideas, but how are we going to finance it? Right? How are we going to capitalize uh, and shift some of that conversation to like, hey, we know resources are, are, are necessary, but don't overlook the assets that you already have and the resources that are in your community. So an orientation around that, I think, would be very helpful, right, um, that I think is missing. Then another piece, you know, trying to be exhausted, the, the, the climate justice, the ecological, and the, and, and the solidarity economy have to grow stronger with, it, with each other. That's another critical sector that I think is not deeply grounded as it, as it should be. And then I think there's a new piece, which, which uh, not a new piece, but a piece that I think, I hope is going to get some renewed energy and focus. And that is the connection with, with you know, the unions organized labor, and uh, uh, the solidarity economy. And I know this is another thing I want to write about is like reintroducing the notion that 
you know, in the United States, co-ops and the, the labor organizing movement largely got disconnected about 100 years ago when they used to really be, you know, two, just two, two ways in which to organize working class people. Uh, and I think we need to, to carry that back. And I think given the, the very conscious and deliberate assaults against organized labor that are going on in this country and some of the main gains you know, now with this, this ultra right wing, you know, social movement and government that we have, um, I think now organized labor, given increasing, you know, uh, losing density, losing membership, uh, you know, losing sectors in which they, they, they have collective bargaining rights, uh, have to refocus and repivot. And then there's a deeper way in which I think both of us have to figure out you know, how do we match our cooperative efforts and then the, the efforts around organized labor? How do we actually match that to scale up to meet the needs of the working class within society as a whole? Because both sectors at this point still leave millions and millions of people out of a viable life. But I think together with the resources and skills that we have, and if we have a serious resist and fight orientation, grounded in both, it could be a very powerful transformative uh, uh, element that I think this country needs. But we have to do some very, I think, on our end, I think, uh, uh, on, I'm saying from the end of the solidarity economy, I think we are going to have to lead the charge in the reaching out to organized labor, because I still think that they're, they're still in shock a bit, I think, from, from the recent Supreme Court. Uh, decision, but also I think trapped in, in some old ways yeah. of thinking about organizing that I think we're going to constantly have to push against and open up. And I think, you know, one of the critical pieces to me about really emphasizing this is because one of the things that organized labor, I think we'll have at least for another decade, is that um, the big unions in particular, uh, you know, they have uh, um, various portfolios and resources of their own that they have amassed and they have investment arms that, that, that they put into, you know, uh, uh, various investments into the, the stock market, the housing market, and all these things that they do. We need to struggle with them to redirect those to A, actually serve the interests of your, your members in their productive capacity and transforming the productive capacity and not invest in things which while they may make money for your pension, but are actually undermining the, the very the, the ability of your members to organize and to stay in a certain industry. So there needs to be a redirect. But I think the critical thing is there that they, they have enough resources, uh, you know, like in these reserves, in these funds, in these investment arms that the AFL-CIO have, that could be a major conduit of, of finance for a new type of economy. But it's going to take some political will and leverage, I think, to do that. But it's, it's where I think a critical piece where we need to go that, you know, there are resources there that we don't think about that are already really in the control of other working class forces that I think just need to be redirected. And I think it's worth it to mention the that the connect is made in a, in a, a limited way between unions uh, and, and um, co-ops, right? So for example, the union co-op um, initiative, um, like the, probably the, the, most, right, the most advanced example being um, CUCI, Cincinnati Union Co-op Initiative, um, which is you know, part of this national effort to create more of these alliances. Um, you know, I think it's a limited number of unions that are, um, are expressing interest and support and devoting a little bit of resources into developing cooperatives. Mm -hmm. um, and getting back to that, you know, that original crucible that both unions and cooperatives were born out of, of trying to, you know, liberate people from the exploitation of, of a capitalist work right. uh, by mm -hmm. owning, you know, owning our own businesses um, and stores, etc. cetera. Um, so that's an important point. Um, absolutely. That's a great list. I don't know if there's any more that you want to add to that of tools that seem tools and, and strategies that seem really critical. Um, 
Do you have anything else, or I, I we, have? We can go on. One other maybe, thing. Okay. Maybe, maybe folks. See, I think we're getting close to like the thirty Quick minutes. Q and A. Questions. Yeah, I think. I think so. I want to ask you, I want to slip in one more um, question or framing, um, because I think the community production piece is really, really exciting. Um, but I also just want to put it in the context of, um, of artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, by some estimates that have been widely circulated. Um, the projection is that 40%, 40% of the jobs in the United States are vulnerable to computerization um, by 2030. That is not very far off, even if it's a fraction of 40%, right? That's a devastating amount, right? So for all of us who are working to build, you know, to build these practices, to build, to create jobs, to help people get trained up into these new sectors, if we lose, I mean, you know, 20, 30, 40% of jobs, um, you know, what? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're looking at a pretty, possibly pretty bleak future. And I think community production has a role there, right? Like, or some people who are just really fearful of the whole thing just coming crashing down, right? The whole economy just imploding. Um, what do we do then? And then we're, we're talking about, um, I think we're, we're thinking about community production. What can we, what can we start producing on a community level for our own use, not for you know tr selling and making profit? So, just wondering about your your thoughts about that, especially in the the context of this seismic shift that we're we're actually in the midst of, right? We're already seeing these these huge changes in in, in the market. So, just wondering. Well, I mean, about you, that. you've you've touched on it already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Um, uh, I would point folks to an article that we produced in, in uh, earlier this year, January, called Countering the Fabrication Divide, where we try to lay out, you know, why we are pursuing this. And a big part of it is, is dealing with that particular concern about being uh, displaced. And, and in our case, you know, uh, I make an argument, many people may have read uh, in that, that Large sectors of the Black community uh, in the United States constitute one of the one of the uh, uh, surplus population, you know, uh, within the global system of production. And you have a system which is now trying to figure out what to do with the surplus because they honestly don't have a plan. You know, the the other side, you know, uh, uh, the ruling class, they really don't have a plan. Um, and so we better come up with our own plans because we know what happens when. Um, you know, they start coming up with uh, uh, grand schemes of expansion and transformation. Uh, it's the reason why, you know, uh, North America's indigenous populations were almost driven to the brink of extinction. Um, and I don't put that past this system. I really don't. I, I, you know, I always hate to bring that up, uh, but I don't. And I think there's enough evidence throughout the globe today if we really stand back and just look at the nature and the scale of all the conflicts that are taking place, particularly in Africa and Asia, I mean, it's profound. Uh, and the degree yeah. of, uh, to which people are uh, uh, being forced to move uh, from all the different conflict zones. I mean, there are more uh, people on the move, you know, uh, probably at any point in time in history, at least in terms of sheer numbers and that's only going to to grow um you know as, as the climate crisis worsens and more areas become uh, uh uninhabitable and, and not productive uh, so we're in for a major seismic shift at a very at the very time when the productive capacity of the system itself um requires less and less workers so uh for us we was we it's really a very, what we would call a very injurious politics that we're trying to explore here with us getting into community production and trying to get ahead of the curve and saying this technology can, will, can either be utilized to the benefit of humanity or it will be utilized to the detriment of the vast majority of humanity. And we are still at a place, we think, that that decision can still be made but through mass organizing and mass pressure. 
So us entering into the frame now saying, hey, we are going to experiment as best we can with the limited resources we can to demonstrate that you can, you can produce both in a different way and in a different scale to serve some community needs. And with the hope and effort that more of our communities will take up this example and, and you know, improve upon it, expand upon it, and then we can create our own federated networks of, of production to meet our own needs as the system under you know, capital's control moves less and less to excluding us. And, and so folks are clear part of what, you know, to give an example of, of what we mean, you know, Jackson, um, for those of you who don't know, Jackson is only roughly about 200,000 people. You know, it's 80% black, uh, uh, overwhelmingly poor. And uh, one of the main anchors of its economy outside of, of government, because it's the capital of, st of the state. Uh, so a lot of government offices are there on the federal, uh, state, county, and, and municipal level. Uh, and so outside of that being a major source of employment, Jackson is, is a regional node of, of transportation. You know, so we sit at, at, a, at a crossroads, both in terms of railroad and freeways, um, and, and access to the water, the Mississippi, um, you know, between uh, basically New Orleans and Chicago and Atlanta and Dallas. And we serve that kind of transition route in all the different ways between. That means that trucking and, and the, the transportation industry and the warehousing, that's a major component of the economy in Jackson. And it's a major source of employment, particularly for black men, young black men, you know, between like the ages of 25 and, and 50, really. and when, because I think it is a matter of when now, when, you know, the trucking industry goes to, to you know, uh, driverless trucks, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's easily, say, one-fifth of, of uh, the employment gone from our economy uh, alone. So this threat is not something that's abstract. It, has a, it would have a material impact immediately in, in my community. Uh, in Jackson. So us trying to intervene and saying, hey, let us get, get our foot into this game and figure out how to democratize the technology. And then, you know, not just democratize the technology, but we also have to think of ourselves and need to think of ourselves of taking it and innovating it, right? We are also producers in, in, of technology. And that would take a long conversation to, to go back and and talk about well, at least what I know within the black community, the different things that we have contributed to, you know, uh, uh, as technology that people don't often think about. Uh, one, so to give cite one example is, is like uh, in hip hop, all the different innovations around turntables and mixers and, you know, all those things came very specifically to meet the need of that culture of production, uh, which came from our own innovation and steps and little incremental pieces. But we can, we can think about that and need to think about it deliberately and, and, start to train you know, our young folks in particular in how to be, uh, 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 how to have a level of self-control and self-determination in this changing world uh, as we see it and not be a subject to all the changes, but it actually help to create the change and to do so in a manner you know, which, which create equity and equality within society. So I don't, it's not a field that clearly that we don't take lightly. There's a lot of strategic thinking around for us uh, around looking at uh, a jobless future and how do we counter that and what steps can we take, you know, uh, first on our local kind of municipalist level uh, in a local context of a limited size and scope. But we, we are gonna try to do as much experiment as we can to make the real shift with, with the technology that's, that's focused on improving the overall quality of life and ensuring that there is a basic means by which folks can receive the goods and services they need with or without uh, uh, fiat currencies or hard currencies, we understand it. So that's, that's a broader conversation of how we're thinking about integrating other aspects of uh, this te technology uh, like blockchain and some of the potential, but also some of the limitations that it had that also comes uh, with some of this thinking and some of the strategy.
That's beautiful. That's great. I just I just want to add one thing, which is that community production can also it can be the high tech, which I is what I think is the new thing about community production, but can also include the low tech, right? So right. what what can we produce that we need to survive, right? To have to right. have you know healthy uh, livelihood. So it's everything like from growing your own food or community gardening to, you know, the skill shares, the DIY uh, workshops, that kind of stuff, right? Can um, just to add on to that, Emily, so folks yeah. understand for us, like we, there is, for us, there is no community production without a baseline of, of a level of food security leading to yeah. food sovereignty. And for yeah. that, you don't need a great deal of high tech for at all but it's the basis by which we think that we can transform the, the, the our local economy if we can secure that basic base, which makes it easier because we know we have the capacity to feed ourselves and we know we have abundance of skill in that area already in the community and we have enough kind of vacant land. So it's like really redirecting what we think about what we need and some fundamental ways to create the, the political shift and deeper cultural shift. So it doesn't, when we talk about community production, just to make it clear, the high end part is the new part, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but, but it's not, when we say community production, it's not all for us in any, in any sense, you know, it's really a bridge for us for a piece that I talked about earlier. How do we create this, this eco village and, and the high tech, tech technology, if it can't reproduce itself and we can't reproduce it, then ultimately it's a, it's a, it's something that we're dependent on outside. So we got to get it to the level in which it's self-sustainable on that piece, which is really not grounded in a whole bunch of new practices, but really reclaiming a lot of old traditional knowledge Absolutely. and practice. Absolutely. Perfect. Great. Okay, so um, we're going to turn to some of the questions. So folks are welcome to log questions in the... Um, let's see. I guess there's a Q&A box. Yeah, um, um, hopefully. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Marcus and I have been um, um, tracking the questions and oh. um, we have we have three folks, at least so far in the process of the conversation who have um, um, shared some stuff. And I, we were thinking that maybe what we could have is have Lou Novak, um, Gabriela Garcia and Tim Brias ask their questions. I can unmute you guys. You can ask your questions as a stack. Um, and then maybe you and um, Kali can respond to them, and then we'll take another another stack. Does that can I good? ask a Can I ask a question? Sometimes um, I find it's nice to have maybe three questions at a time, and then you can. Often it ends up being a mix and match. Would that be possible? Like ask them all together. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what we were thinking. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So Lou, let me let me um, unmute you first so that you can ask your question. Okay, you should be unmuted now. Uh, thank you very much for taking my questions and thank you for the, uh, the webinar today. I had a couple questions. One was around scaling, scaling your um, uh, solidary econom economy efforts. Uh, here in Detroit, we have a very large geographical region with a uh, dwindling population I'm just wondering how you measure a scale, whether it's you know geographical region, number of people, uh, population, uh, or what's needed. Uh, the other question was around, as a retired uh, techie, how can I uh, sort of, how can technically oriented individuals and organizations uh, help support and contribute to the solidarity economy effort? Thank you. Great, and then um, Gabriela Garcia, let me um, unmute you so you can introduce yourself and ask, ask or share what your thoughts were. Gabriela, are you there? It looks like her mic, her mic is uh, muted. It's like going I'm based in Los Angeles. I am part uh, co-founder of Liberate, which is a language and healing justice worker cooperative. So we're envisioning this came at the perfect timing. We're having this conversation. And for me, it was actually more of a comment as we're building, a, as we're talking about goods 
and, produ and productions and all of these other elements that take to build the alternate, alternative economy. I was just, you know, uplifting the part that then we all have to be building with each other and actually using, building up those, um, those goods and services. For example, you were talking about, you know, just what it takes to produce something in the communities down to like printing services. If there's a co working, you know, a printing co-op, we should use that. Or if we need translation or interpretation, you know, we go to our worker co-op. So I think it's something that I think is at the heart of the, of the work. And I think just how we do that better how do we connect better because we're in Los Angeles right the second largest in the city and we're still feeling like we're all our folk we're all our like co-op folks so as you know we're learning we're meeting more folks the U.S. Federation of Cooperative Cooperatives will their conference will be here in September so we're really looking forward to meeting more folks but out so I guess I don't know if it's a question or a comment but like how do we better connect with each other so we're utilizing and uplifting you know the the work that we're all building again as far as like the productive but the production goods services part of it um and then the last question is from Andrea. um let me unmute you Okay, Kim, are you there? Oops, she's also muted. Hello? Hi there. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great, great, yes. Um, so I am uh, the founder of a small business, uh, Gentle Disposition. It's actually wonderful in the fact that it's not something that can be automated um, or outsourced. It's a service for families who've lost a loved one and need help taking care of the belongings of a loved one or need an entire home cleared. And this is a service um, that I've made some effort to put forward uh, to be adopted. I'm not, I'm actually offering this business um, for free to groups that will build worker cooperatives. And um, there's not many early adopters in the world. So my efforts so far haven't been successful. So I, I just wanted to ask, is there, is this kind of an offer, is there a viable path to advance existing businesses that are willing to, um, to make themselves available for groups that want to build worker cooperatives? Uh, great, so that's three, three groups of questions. Um, Colleen, do you wanna go first? I have, I have some thoughts as well, um, but do you wanna go first? I'll try to be very quick. You know, maybe we can get a couple in. I see we're at one fifteen. So on on the question of scale, um, there's a there's a component that we have to figure out to get to scale. I think almost anywhere. Um, that that was part of the the first question that, that uh, Emily raised, and I want to come back to that. And that is uh, community organizing, right? To be able to reach more people and to put them in connection. Uh, with each other, because uh, I know one of the problems I've seen in a lot of co-ops uh, uh, around the country uh, is is they, a lot of co-ops have a struggle uh, to maintain uh, worker owners uh, and to find folks with with the skills that they need. Um, and I think there's a you know there's an organizing component, as I was understanding, of, which is you know learning what people's capacities are and what they're willing to do and how to move them. Uh, to where the needs are that fit their skills, right? Uh, as a basic kind of element of organizing and, and um, putting all of those pieces in connection with each other, I think is a critical piece to building the bridges in the way that we were talking about earlier to the different social movements so, so that we build that, you know, the overall capacity of both. Uh, uh, so that's one piece I think uh, uh, is necessary uh, to reach scale. And then, of course, there's the resource challenge, uh, the capitalization challenge that I think we have to figure out. And, and I think there's political ways that we have to deal with that. Uh, one that we haven't talked about, but I think I want to put out here just as an idea for folks to consider research, um, you know, and examine is this idea of, of creating public banks, you know, for public resourcing, uh, something that, not, you know, is a long-term thing that we're looking at. Uh, many of you might have more 
you know, different things in different places will advance in different periods, different times, right? So you all in different areas, wherever you might be, might that might be something you can advance quickly where other things might take more time. So just put that out as a piece. But we're also, the scale question is also right now, a, 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 in addition to an organizing question, it is a resource question. So that's that, that's one thing. In terms of the techie thing, just to be real, real simple, for, for, for us, we could use your tech... <laughs> Uh, uh, expertise, uh, if you're willing to to lend it to some of the work that we're doing uh, around the community production uh, co-op, and you can just give us a, a email, uh, shoot us an email, cooperationjackson uh, at gmail.com, or me personally, Kali Akuno at gmail.com to connect you with folks. But I think there's also, you know, in Detroit, I know that there are a number of uh, amazing, innovative work that's going on there. Uh, so maybe putting you in contact if, you, if you're not already in contact uh, with some of the different folks I know could use some tech service ranging from, you know, some of the food production work to some of the, the community production work that's already uh, uh, taking place there that we are actually learning from uh, uh, very consciously and deliberately. Um, so out, out in uh, there, uh, Emily, for now. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, another thing about the tech is um, I know that May 1st People Link, which is a tech co op, um, they're national, they're actually international, they're also in Mexico and the US. I know that they are organizing um, a bunch of different tech uh, summits in the United States, and then they're all converging in a big a big summit in Mexico City. So if you don't know them already, um, yeah, check out May 1st. Um, they're really a movement uh, tech co-op. Um, so just to let people know about that. Um, as to how to connect better, um, a little bit I think what you're talking about, Gabriela, is is what we might call supply chains or in, in our terminology might be called solidarity chain. So a supply chain, would be in, in sort of traditional economic terms is connecting the producers with the suppliers, right? And how do you have making sure that those, um, you know, those relationships are built. And so in solidarity economy, we're trying to figure out how to do that as well, right? right? So if you're producing clothing, how to connect with a solidarity economy um, dye manufacturer and a solidarity economy uh, uh, fabric maker etc right so um and then and then how to connect forward so who's selling your uh, your solidarity economy t-shirts right and then where do you get your financing so that this gets beyond just a supply chain to where you um getting your financing and where are you who's doing your marketing and uh you know what social media are you using etc 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 or or maybe you're using social currencies right to 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 carry out exchanges, so building those um, those uh, solidarity chains uh, is really important. I will mention one tool uh, that we helped to develop, which is a solidarity economy map. So it, the intent of it, so it's national. Um, the intent was not only just to make the solidarity economy visible. Um, uh, so that we can actually believe in it, right? How much there is out there, but also the intent absolutely was to help to build these relationships, these economic relationships, these solidarity chains. Um, so you could check out that um, and um, probably we can send out the, the link to that somehow. Um, yeah, the last question about the the small business, like offering a business as a gift, it sounds like is what you're offering, Kim. That's wonderful. I mean, I guess off the top of my head, we, I, I would think we would certainly be happy through our listserv um, and maybe our website just to put that out there and see, you know, and support that and see, you know, say this sounds like a, a great idea. Maybe if you provided some more details about how it is, how it works, um, you know, how it is viable as a business, and then we can put it, float it out there and see um, if there's take up on it. That's off the top of my head what I can think, but I, you know, that those that kind of sharing is absolutely um, integral to solidarity economy. So I'll stop there. And uh, I don't know if there are more, if there's another round of questions. Um, we do have one more question from Jonathan Chai Chang Atzerbaum. 
um, which which is a pretty uh, uh, potentially in-depth question. So, and then we might just take that one last question and then have um, you and Kali close it out with um, with closing thoughts. Um, Jonathan, you want to ask your question? Uh, let me make sure you're unmuted. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, my, I'll just read my question. Um, it was, what are some ideas and strategies that we have for integration and creating economic blocks with movements in other parts of the world? I know this is a big question. Um, particularly as people living in the US, how do we ensure that our vision and strategy is anti-imperialist, just given how different- Can you speak up just a little bit? I, 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 it's hard for me to hear you. Sorry. Um, well, which part did you hear? I heard, almost heard nothing of what you said, honestly. Okay. Um, what are some ideas and strategies that we have for integration and creating economic blocks with movements in other parts of the world? Mm -hmm. And particularly as folks living in the U.S., how do we ensure that our vision and strategy is anti-imperialist? Carl, you want to go first? Um, questions after my own heart. Um, Uh, that is a long conversation, um, which I am more than willing to have. Um, trying to think of a couple of quick things, I think, to touch on uh, here. Um, now, let me start with the, with the last piece about anti-imperialism. Um, uh, one of the things that Emily brought out, I think correctly so, uh, and kind of defining is the, the um, I think was the word used, non-denominational uh, um, nature of the economy. Pluralism? That it's not a one-size-fits-all model. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. Yeah. Um, and that it's based around principles. Now, uh, I want us to keep that in mind, but I think let's, let's not, at least from my vantage point, our vantage point, uh, should not be uh, devoid of radical principles around what pluralism means. It, it means challenging uh, the ability of uh, others to exploit or anyone to exploit anyone's labor. And I think there are some deeper questions that are tied to uh, in fact, some of the questions that the, the solidarity economy has to figure out around this solidarity slash supply chain uh, piece, because a lot of the, the raw goods and materials, particularly the raw materials that uh, we utilize, and in particular, you know, uh, fruits, foods uh, that we uh, utilize and incorporate, uh, come from very exploitative social relations, some of the most deeply exploited social relations. So being very conscious and, and uh, deliberate uh, around the uh, solidarity supply chain is one way I think those of us in the US have to be rooted in thinking about that very consciously and deliberately and thinking about it you know, beyond just your fair trade form of analysis, right? Um, because I think there are ways in which we also very clearly have to give both material and political support to our, uh, uh, you know, corresponding movements and organizations, uh, particularly in the global South, uh, who are waging a different level and a different type of struggle against empire. And we need to be clear about uh, the weight that we have both with, with uh, the resources you know, in, in the form of buying this or that, um, that, that can alter or shift and give them a little bit more strength and leverage to maneuver in their own context to overall weaken the system that I don't think that we're doing enough of. You know, I know uh, Repest has some level of conversation about uh, us doing more across, you know, quote unquote national boundaries uh, but I think that there's a deeper level of political conversation that needs to happen around, uh, again, where are we aiming, where are we headed, what type of world do we want, uh, that the solidarity economy in a general sense, I think, is is leaning towards. But there is a deeper debate that still needs to be had, at least from my perspective, uh, both within the, the worker co-op movement in the U.S., but also the, the solidarity economy movement on the whole, 
uh, around some ex explicit uh, anti-capitalist politics and anti-capitalist orientation and building, you know, for a post-capitalist world. And I'm using terms in a, in a very general sense uh, um, that I think most folks could relate to and leave a level of variance in, in whether one sees that as, you know, uh, aiming towards socialism or aim, aiming towards an in, in anarchist society. Um, I think there's enough variance that we can be, in, we need to be at this stage uh, wherever side of that equation that you fall on, uh, be pushing in the same direction towards creating more political space, more political leverage for the overall uh, movement that enable folks to make more concrete, liberating choices for themselves. So, um, but it starts with political work. And so the, to answer your questions, clearly one of the ways in which I know Cooperation Jackson and I see myself as a, as a, one of the primary spokesperson for Cooperation Jackson is always trying to articulate a clear political orientation around their need. This has to be wedded to political struggle. This movement has to be wedded to political struggle. It has to be wedded for political struggle, which leans towards and bends towards the anti capitalist direction. And folks in their own local context then define what that is, how, to, how it's expressed. But that's a piece that we are constantly. In, in, in effect, agitating for, to get people to not forget, not exclude, and not just be trapped into, you know, our co-ops co in the solidarity economy have to just fit within the standard business frame and, and point of reference in order to survive. We are very explicitly challenging that in different ways. All, always friendly, always open debate, but it's something that we always constantly try to put on the table to shift the conversation so we can have real discussions about what anti-imperialism means, what anti-capitalism means within the framework of doing this work. That's great. Um, I will add some just more, more kind of practical, concrete uh, formations. So one is, is um, as Kali mentioned, RIPES, right, the Intercontinental International Network, Solidarity Economy Network. Um, it does include uh, uh, networks, local networks from every single continent. And certainly Latin America absolutely is by far and away the most, um, like they have the clearest political analysis as a, as a block um, and the most radical for sure. But so that's really helpful, right? So the these solidarity economy networks um, on the continental, national, local level, sectoral level can also speak for themselves um, and bring that um, into the into repess um, uh, in terms of being uh, building an anti-imperialist uh, movement. Um, another thing I just want to mention quickly is there's um, there is information over the next couple years a World Social Forum on transfor transforming the economy. Um, so that'll be an interesting space to have these these um, conversations, um, and then. The third thing that we were just all at, um, Kali, Ivan, Marcus, and I, we were all at this um, Fearless Cities um, conference in New York City. So that's an international um, effort initiative to think about how cities um, can start both engage in the resist and the build. Um, and some of the cities that are at the forefront of building solidarity economy. Well, one example uh, is, is in Barcelona and they were an organizer. So a few things just to keep an eye out for, uh, to maybe check out um, their work and, uh, and their notices as things progress. Um, so um, I think we're, we're one minute over time. Um, I think we'll wrap this up. I want to thank um, Kali so much for sharing his wisdom, his depth of analysis, um, and, and just brilliance with us. It's been super great to talk. Uh, really wonderful, as always. And I want to thank also Yvonne and Marcus for helping to organize this, as well as fielding the questions. And thank everybody for just tuning in. And um, I hope that you'll join us for part two um, when we do get that scheduled. Um, anybody else want to say any closing comments? No, thank you all for putting this uh, together. And thank everybody for you know, tuning in, listening, participating. Um, let's keep it up. We need more of these. Absolutely. OK, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.